Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for spending your time um, today. So I'm going to, I have studied bullying for 18 years. And in addition, because bullying has changed, and at least in the US context, that has moved me into studying sexual harassment, sexual violence, and most recently, dating violence. Um, my work has been, and I'll tell this story that I just told you, largely influenced by social network uh, theory, um, nauseous theories. I'm not an expert in social network analysis. I would spend all my time doing that if I wanted to keep up with Sienna models. What I do is try to get graduate students very, very much excited about social network analysis, but I'm really driven by my ultimate uh, quest, and that is to understand how social network theory can help us prevent bullying in schools. And so I'm going to show you a few of those studies. Um, but in 1997, when I came to the University of Illinois, um, and as a good graduate student, I had read quite a bit at Indiana University about um, social network analysis and was excited to get a tenure track position so I could spend my time designing that ultimate study. And that ultimate study was one to call into question this notion that bullies in the US were somehow lacking in social skills. Through my research, it looked like they held really high social status within the networks and and so as a naive assistant professor, I heard that Stanley Wasserman was over in the psych department. So I walked over and knocked on his door and introduced myself. And since then, Stanley Wasserman has helped me, um, introduced me to NOSH. And then I've been working very closely one, with both one of their former uh, postdocs, Harold Green, who's now at RAND. Um, and so I, am, I tend to be an interloper, if you will, into social network analysis. Um, but, and I also want to say that we have a lot of data that if anything perks your interest here, we have lots of network data if you're into adolescent networks longitudinally. And we ask questions of kids. You'll be surprised what the IRB allows us to ask of sixth, seventh, and eighth graders in the United States, which makes it very, very intriguing for some social network scholars because they're just shocked that we could ask a sixth grader whether or not someone touched their private parts. Anyway, so I can talk you through that as well. Uh, I must say that this research is funded not only by the Centers for Disease Control, but National Science Foundation, and most recently, the National Institutes of Justice have given us some money to follow some of our kids, um, allowing us to do some longitudinal network stuff into high school over, it will be over a five-year period, which is nice. So we've been at it. What you don't see behind me are 27 PhD students, about 1,000 undergrads that collect real data. We don't simulate data. I have a lot of computer science friends that take our data and then scale it up. But we go in and we, in, we interview and we survey young, live children operating in real schools and real environment. So that's kind of a, that's a positive thing. It's quite a bit of work. In addition to that, we've done a lot of work over the last 18 years. Um, one of the most exciting things we have going on right now is we are funded by the Centers for Disease Control to randomized clinical trial of a bullying prevention program in this country. So we are now currently in 36 middle schools in year two of a three-year longitudinal uh, nested design where we match schools. So we have a nice RCT there. And we're just imputing missing data from pre to post at this point. Um, and then we'll run our multi-level modeling and see if we have an effect. Of course, we're going to survey the kids for two more years. So we know that that's not a complete picture. Um, but we also know that implementation is going to matter and lots of other moderators. Um, so we're just doing lots of work. What I want to talk to you today about is three specific studies. But in case anyone's interested in what else we have going in the lab, and most of our, all of our studies, I would say 100 of them, we collect network data just in case someone wants to analyze all these network data beyond what we do with them. And you'll see kind of what we're doing with them now. Um, so I have about eight PhD students and a number of colleagues at Illinois who are working on the randomized clinical trial. We also, as a psychologist, one reason we're able to disseminate our knowledge to mass media, to teachers, to Congress, to Senate, is because we take this idea, we want to understand why kids are aggressive, but we also want to understand why some kids aren't aggressive. Right? So it's what we call risk and protective factors around bullying, sexual violence, and dating violence. We also know in the area of dating violence in high school in the United States that it is very much dominated by peer norms. If guys hang out with other guys that are rude to their girlfriends, 
you will become more like them over time. Um, so social networks fits in nicely there. We're also looking at bullying victimization and the link to later alcohol and drug use. We're very close to securing some funds from National Institutes of Health to actually do a very specific network study looking at how it is that alcohol and drug use can, becomes what we call a contamination effect among adolescent high school students. Um, and that will be part of the work that we do with RAND. We're also very much concerned about the kids that come to our schools with various forms of victimization. It's called polyvictimization. Um, in that you've heard of the recent suicides, there's been 12 in the last year that's been linked to bullying victimization in the United States. The problem with the way that the media delivers those stories is that there's an assumption that they were just bullied in school and their life was just so perfect before. The reality is those kids are typically victimized in their home, victimized in their neighborhoods, and then it's the last straw, if you will, the last effort for them to feel okay. They get victimized at school. And typically about 8% of our population are kids that are victimized at home, online, and face-to-face. -face. And so if you cannot escape it, those are the poly victims. So we're, we're studying and trying to understand that. And one, trying to get the media to stop presenting this suicide phenomenon as a bully suicide. 15% of the suicides in the United States can be linked to bullying, 15%. That means 85% of the suicides can be attributed to something else. We're also starting to do some gang work um, and starting to look at specifically in parts of this state where public housing vouchers south, so when they tore down all Caprini Green, they handed out Section 8 vouchers and they went to central Illinois. We now have a huge grant gang presence in neighboring towns around Champaign. We're starting to do some network studies. They enter into gangs by the sixth grade. So in the United States, that's 10 years old. And so we're trying to track the, the gangs, although the problem with these networks in this particular town, they're very transient gangs. And it's, it's drugs, essentially. So they're up and down Chicago to central Illinois. So we'll have network data there. We're also doing some studies uh, around African-American bullying, which is not studied. So how it is that black children banter. Many of you may have heard of uh, yo mama jokes that white kids are adopting in the United States. That comes from the African-American oral tradition of roasting or playing the dozens. And then some very exciting work that has involved some of your collaborators in the room. One study that's being funded by NSF with Scott Poole as a lead PI, Nash is a co-PI as well. We're trying to use the technology of group scopers and take that technology out on the playground. We just missed the playground season. It's cold. Kids are not on the playground. So IRB was holding us up for months on end. But in the spring, once uh, the kids can go back outside, we will do 10 observations situating the cameras and uh, figuring out which, we're at this point, figuring out which mics to buy and where to locate them. We do have a school that's agreed for us to observe their children 10 different times so we can try to uh, figure out some smart ways of studying the actual networks versus assuming a lot of assumptions underlying a lot of the networks that we do. We also were just funded by NSF to develop two what we call games, uh, collaborative and competitive. I wanted to test some kind of theory driven. I wanted to test Patricia Hawley's idea that bullies will be very nice to you. They'll bring you in nice to you. That's one strategy, pro-social. Once they have you in, then become me. So they'll be, they'll be your friend, and then they become coercive. And it's called the bi-strategic uh, theory. It's mostly ba based on primate theory. It's exactly what, if you go to the zoo, you'll see happening. Well, if you hang out in middle schools like I hang out, it looks much like the zoo in the United States context because they will become your friends, and then they'll become coercive. We developed some, it's two computer games. This is with A. Al Amir, computer scientist, artificial intelligence at UIUC. And we were able to actually show that those kids identified, who identified themselves as bullies on a survey, identified by their peers as a bully, did in fact, when in a competitive game, they would be nice to you, and then in a back chat that they thought we couldn't see, because we used deception in the study, they cussed the children out and threatened them to get their coins to win the game. So they were nice, they were pro-social, and they were coercive. So we've tested that theory. We're trying to get some more money, because a year NSF funding wasn't very long. 
Um, so now why, why do I feel social network analysis is applicable? Now, I'm going to bring you to a very timely fashion because everyone in here has noticed that we have this obsession right now with school bullying. Um, that clearly it's a problem. The problem has been here for hundreds of years. It's probably not going to go away. And the media will start focusing on something else. Nothing has changed in bullying except it's become younger. What we used to see in fifth grade is now in preschool playgroups. So that's kind of the trend, but we don't have an epidemic, right? Kids in U.S. schools have always been mean, and there have always been bullies, and we don't have any more than we had 20 years ago. Now, when everybody thinks technology is introducing a new cast of bullies, it's not. It's just a different way. Instead of passing notes, like I passed notes 25 years ago, or I'd write something on the bathroom about to, now I just put it on Facebook, or I send you a text, so it's just a different medium. But what we're dealing with is that the science behind bullying, the social science, clearly indicates, and I'll show you some of these studies, that bullying is maintained through the networks of the peers. That if, in fact, I, we want these kids to intervene, we want kids to do the right thing, but if that's not what the norm is in the network, they're not going to do it. So the problem is, is that we have many, many prevention programs, upwards of 70 prevention programs that are offered to schools, one of which attempts to change the peer norm. So let me tell you how we're doing here in the United States. You guys are familiar with meta-analysis, right? OK, so we have 70-some programs. We have one program from Norway that has the support of the federal government as a proven program, yet we have no US data that's, that it's working. It should be surprising to you that if we have that many programs in this long history of lots of research, why it is the first, me first meta-analysis was published in 2008. In this meta-analysis, there's only 16 studies. Now, that's the absolute minimum to even do a meta-analysis, right? I mean, you can go down to 13, but 16, you better have some really good effects in some ways. Now, this was 16 studies across six countries. That's really kind of embarrassing for the field. Only six of these studies were in the U.S., and only two of the studies were published, two were published in the U.S. Okay, so we're basing all of this on two published studies, essentially, in the U.S. And publication matters, right? I mean, it's not a pleasurable thing to try to get published, but it's a process that we all respect. So in this meta-analysis showed that there are small to negligible effects in the programs that are being promoted and endorsed. If you lowered your, your rigor and your p-value, then you would find that there's some small positive effects for enhancing social confidence and peer acceptance. So there's some suggestion that perhaps if you are have a more cohesive peer group, you're more accepting that you might have an effect. Increasing teacher knowledge and efficacy in implementing the intervention, but the reality is the meta-analysis said there's no, no change in bullying behavior. Zero, still true. Come up to 2009, and in the UK, they've now analyzed 70 studies. And in the Farrington Report, which you can get online, I'm sure you guys are going to write home and read these meta-analysis and know exactly why it is that bullying is not slowing down in our schools. None in this study, none of the U.S. studies demonstrated efficacy, zero, if you go through the appendices, nothing. For those that were working in European countries, it included parents, it included the use of multimedia, and it targeted the teacher's competence. So why is, why is things not working in the U.S.? Well, I think many of the programs fail to recognize that bullying co-occurs with other type of aggression in our economy. We're a very aggressive society. Kids are very aggressive from a young age. We try to socialize them into pro-social behavior, but aggression works in this country, and aggression works within the context of our schools. Our schools are extremely violent. In addition to that, we know that if, in fact, bullying is about a power dynamic, then that power dynamic and need for control and dominance is going to span over into other relationships. And that means sexual harassment for us and dating violence, which is at the highest rate ever in the United States. So clearly, we're socializing kids into thinking that they can harass others, and then they do it within the context of eating dating relationships by high school. Many of the programs fail to address basic life and social skills that kids need. We are obsessed with just don't bully. 
don't do it. Because we as adults can't think, why, why would kids bully? But yet, in the United States, adults bully all the time, right? And we say to kids, just stick up for that person and be an upstander bystander. The problem is they don't have the skills necessarily to do it. And I want to come down to this last one, and this is what we're going to start to talk about, the complexity. What I'm trying to confuse in the social science literature is the complexity around these things as adults. We think we can very easily shift the peer norm that is very, very powerful. And I'm going to show you percentages of variance explained that I don't do in any other, I never get a 90% explanation of variance in any of my other studies. But once you start to look at these phenomena at the peer group level, you're explaining that amount of variance. So because only one program, and it's the one we're testing, recognizes that bullying perpetration is initiated, it sustains itself, it's maintained in a very strong tradition within the peer group. So much so that there's a code of silence, right? that kids will not tell adults about what's happening because that's just, there's too much, if you put it in even P-star language, there's too much cost associated with me doing this intervention. Okay. okay, so I'll get you up to speed on about 100 years of network structure and aggression. It was only in the last few decades that we really abandoned social network studies if we look at aggression and bullying. Many of my developmental scholars talked about the importance of the context of peers. That would be Erie Broffenbrenner's work of a social ecological perspective, understanding um, that kids and friendships matter, the emotion of homophily and socialization, that we're going to birds of a feather flock together, that we influence both what we decide to do and how it is that we see the world. Um, so lots of friendship studies have been done. We find that children who have friends generally have the more social, cooperative, less lonely. There's what we call sociometric studies where we ask kids, who do you like, who do you not like? So dislike studies, rejected studies. In those studies, we found that bullies are, tend to be in what's called a complicated strategy. Some kids, they may category. And that kids may not like them, but they afford them popularity because they're cool in some ways. And so they're in this kind of confused state. Then Bob Carnes is um, introduced in his own way uh, network studies, uh, mostly doing some sophisticated principal components analysis, to be honest. Um, and he would do this saturated method, of, which dominated in our field. And the reason I talk about it is because I still get reviewers saying, why didn't you use Bob Carnes' method? And his is the social cognitive mappings. What he, will, he did, he has now left us, is he would sit down with the kid and he would say, Brooke, who are, your friend, who are the groups of kids in this classroom that hang out together? And Brooke is really nice, so she would provide this information and go, well, this is, these are the groups. And once he felt that he reached saturation, he would stop asking. Now, he didn't ask, who are your friends? He just said, who are the groups that you see? And that was the dominating methodology in developmental psychology up until about 10 years ago. We still get reviewers to say, why didn't you use this method? It's almost like a cult. Everybody has little areas of cultness. Um, there's also at the same time the Ennett and Bauman that asked, who are your friends in this classroom? And then we were able to start looking at reciprocate, reciprocation in the nominations, right? So it hasn't been that long ago that this has actually started to happen. Um, and in these studies, we find heterogeneity among aggressive youth along popularity dimensions. Some bullies are popular, some are not. There's heterogeneity. And then we started to, in our work, in a 2003 paper in Child Development, which is our huge flagship journal, Child Development. After many years, when we first did our network study, Sienna wasn't around. Nicopee was around, but people questioned Nicopee a little bit. So we mapped out by hand the networks, numbers of kids in middle schools. We still have it up in my lab because we don't do that anymore. Right? But we had to somehow convince the Bob Carnes' group that the Nicopee results, which mapped on to us drawing out every nomination, that there was a validity. Then we have observational studies. And the reality is if we had millions of dollars, we would just observe children on a regular basis. 
In Canada, that's what they do. In Canada, they put cameras on the playground. And Deborah Pepler's work, she did this, and it, it was on Dateline, and people still use her data because IRBs do not allow us to observe children on a regular basis. So we actually are limited in the ways in which we think aggression and bullying plays out on the playgrounds and classrooms because parents don't want their kids observed in the United States. So therefore, Finland and Norway and other European countries are passing us by in network studies because they can go in and observe their, okay, you, you feel my pain, right? <laughs> So that's why I team up and to say, can we, can, we demonstrate, can we have an observational strategy that's not gonna cost me a million dollars? We do live observations now and it costs me a million dollars on a project to watch teachers implement a curriculum or watch kids in the classroom, right? So it's very expensive. Um, but we do know from observational studies that students play different roles and this is Sama Vali's work who's done, she has a participant role questionnaire and has done a tremendous amount of work around the various roles and positions that kids play within networks. So let me talk to you about a paper that's coming out in Journal of Early Adolescence. These are kind of the similar studies. We have a number of these types of studies going on with more complex multi-level modeling, but it will give you some sense of how I'm trying to use social networks to identify peer groups to push a theory forward. Um, and what's going to be important here is I'm going to tell you a little bit of the some of the recent research that's out, mostly by the Finnish and Italians who are coming out with some very interesting research around this. Now, why is this important? You'll see it's willingness to intervene. The extent to which middle school kids say, I will intervene. And how it is that their own personal responsibility, that empathy that we think if we just get kids to see how bad things are, that they'll intervene. Or should we consider the peer influences of maybe they're going to look around and see, well, is my friend going to intervene? Because if they're not going to intervene, and I'm going to lose friends, I'm not intervening. Now, this is important because with this bully craze, and there's millions of dollars, if not billions of do dollars, behind bullying prevention right now, because 47 states require a bullying prevention program in each school, so there's lots of money to be made. So if you guys are looking for money, I'm going to give you some ways bullying prevention is the way to go. Um, especially if you can give you know, principals and administrators some quick fix. The big thing now is we have to empower the bystanders. So lots of these programs that are coming out will say, you just need to help that victim. Now, even so that the New Jersey law says that if you don't, as a teacher, you will lose your license. If you are a student and you know that someone was bullied, and by the way, most kids see the bullying. It's done in groups. Most of the times the teachers don't see it. If we're suspending kids because they're not intervening, that's a big problem for us. We're already behind in math and science. And suspending our kids, I say it's not the way to go. Now what that pop literature has done has not been informed by the social network studies. It has not been informed by social science, and now should we be surprised that there's things happening in our schools that are not informed by science? No, we shouldn't. We have reading curriculum in the United States that have never been empirically validated. But let's talk about bullying. So what is this about the willingness to intervene? So I'm going to try again to review a body of literature in a very few, short period of time. Oh. Scholars suggest that including bystanders increases the school-based bullying programs. Bystanders represent about 58% of the bullying phenomenon. You have 15% of that are ringleader bullies, chronic bullies, 17% that are chronically victimized, 8% are bully victims or school shooters. That leaves about 52% in our schools or something like that that are standing around watching, laughing, participating, giving an audience to the bullying. So they're certainly there. So we argue that if we involve them in some ways, maybe this will increase our uh, program's effectiveness. Researchers advocate encouraging bystanders to create a more positive school climate. If there's actually kids that would walk away from a bullying incident, maybe you don't have an audience. Who are you kind of demonstrating your skills to? Maybe that would help. We have really no data to suggest any of these uh, things that people have said, but it's in the literature. Uh, but we also know that self-declared bullies and bystanders sometimes, re sometimes report feeling sorry about bullying their peers, but they continue to do it, right? So, I, yes, I feel bad about it. Okay. Probably because they're about to get in trouble. 
Um, in Australia, Australia has one of the highest rates of bullying in the world. And you can think about the history of Australia. Australia is probably not a surprise, um, much like the history of the United States. So, for example, 43% of the Australian adolescent sample, 400, reported that they would intervene to help a victim depicted in a videotaped bullying situation. But these are simulated ideas, right? Here's a situation, would you intervene? We know the correlation between them saying they would and actually intervening, if we take it from personality theory and other behavioral assessment theory, is about 0.3, right? Kind of like somebody saying they're going to quit smoking. Do they actually quit smoking? None of you smoke, I'm sure. It's not a cool thing to do. Okay, but if we look at observational work, there's stark contrast to the Canadian observation system. And I'm laying the groundwork that we need you folks to really get on top of all the technology to help us collect better data to advance our theories. So observational data in Canada indicated a stark contrast. In their paper, they looked at first through sixth graders during recess outside on the playground. 54% of the peers spent their time reinforcing bullies by passively watching, standing around, probably hoping that the bully didn't turn on them. 21% uh, actively participated. So if you watch these videos, they joined in. And this is both boys and girls, physical and verbal. And intervened only 25% of the time. Older boys were more likely to join actively with the bully than the younger boys and older girls. Girls always intervene more. They always say they will, and they often do in these observational studies. 80% of the bullying episodes involved multiple children, but only of the 88, only 19% intervened. So clearly bullying, which took about a decade to convince the developmentalists that thought there was a bully victim dyad, through our social network studies, we were able to argue that in fact it's a peer group phenomenon. That was huge, just to get them to change their mindset that there's a big bully and a victim. Right? So the social network analysis pushed us to that point. But we have to go further than this, especially given this you must intervene and the fact that we're criminalizing the lack of intervention. Because if I can say to the Senate and Congress, say, this is not this simple. Kids have a decision tree of whether or not they're going to help someone. And we cannot just suspend them and not pay attention to adolescent development and the peer norm. So we go into this. I'm not going to talk about this study. Let me, yeah, OK. So this is an Australian study. And again, he's, this is Rigby. He uses vignettes for the kids. He does not measure network analysis. Um, in his studies, he found that greater, greater willingness to intervene in a bullying episode was related. Younger children were more likely to do it, having rarely or never bullied others. Right. So if I never really, I'm not a bully. That's not what we hear especially. I would intervene to help someone because it's not part of my personality. If someone had been victimized, they might be more likely to intervene. And then generally, having a positive attitude toward the victims. Kids will say, I don't like that kid, so I don't help that kid. That kid deserves it. Right? This is all the stuff that the kids tell us. So it's not simple that they're just going to intervene. Students were more likely to intervene if they believed their friends expected them to support the victims. Already, he didn't collect peer networks. But the kids said, if my friends expected me to do it, I would do it which means we must assess those peer structures. So the friends' attitudes weighed very heavily on the student's decision to intervene, highlighting the need for research that addresses the peer influence. So I'm going to talk to you about this first study. And the second and third study will, make, will flow nicely, because you'll have some sense of the way in which I frame questions. So I wanted to know, are middle school male and female peer groups similar to their, in their level of willingness to intervene? A simply, a simple homophily hypothesis. Not a single paper written with a peer level social network analysis on willingness to intervene. Not at all. Is the willingness to intervene stable over a one year period? Right? So we want to go beyond the cross sectional nature of this. And I want to know peer influence, but you really cannot assess adolescent peer influence in a cross-sectional design because you have to control for their individual propensity in a social science framework. But I also wanted to know, on top of that, when we consider the peer influence um, and holding kind of their individual propensity constant, do attitudes supportive of bullying, do I just think bullying is a cool thing, empathy and perspective taking, 
predict willingness to intervene over time, and then ultimately at the level two, when I take those characteristics aggregated at a peer level, how well do I predict willingness to intervene? Right, because ultimately in social science, it's all about how much variance are you predicting? And we would like to predict 100, but in developmental, that's usually about 20 is what we predict. Okay, so for this study, uh, 210 middle school students, grades 6 and 7, imagine between the ages of 10 and 12. Males and females, uh, one Midwestern middle school. And it's easier for us to do the networks if we stick to school. When we do PSTAR, we actually have to go within one grade to get it to converge. Um, again, I'm not an expert. So these were, surveys were completed in 2003 and 2004, and I can send you this paper that's coming out soon. We have a scale, positive attitudes toward bullying. We ask them things like, a little teasing doesn't hurt anyone. You know, bullying is just part of growing up. If you can't take it, you've got a problem. The alpha is 0.81, which means it's got a nice reliability within this study. It's one that we've developed over the years. We use Davis's perspective taking. So can you understand what someone is thinking? Empathetic concern um, as well. When I see someone being taken advantage of, I feel the need to protect him or her. And the alpha coefficient is 0.79, which suggests that at least the items hold together. And all of these scales actually are very invariant over time as well in this. I don't have time to show you kind of my causal modeling, the construct validity, but we do have it. Uh, we use the Illinois bullying scale that I've developed many years ago. Um, and this includes what's different from aggression. It's teasing, social exclusion, name calling, and rumor spreading. So very different than just physical fighting. We do measure that, but that's, we're talking about the bullying phenomenon. That's repeated over time, and the alphas are 0.88 there. Then we ask them, and this is one of the major mythological flaws in the study, because we don't really know whether they would intervene or not. And that's why we want to start doing these observational studies. I'm also running an NSF grant now to look at teleemergent and how we might place kids through teleemergent kind of environments to see how they intervene, see how it maps onto what they tell us in a survey. Uh, exciting, exciting. Um, so here, if a kid is being teased, I will stick up for him or her. I will tell an adult if a kid is being teased a lot. So we ask them questions, what would they do? Nice distribution. Um, Kronbach Alpha is decent. For friendship nominations, we use the Ed and Bauman approach. We ask them to identify up to eight spots or provided kids you hang out with most in your school. We do not allow them to put siblings. We do not, we try to get them to put names outside of the school because they just become missing data for us. Um, and it's sad some victimized kids want to put themselves. We allow them to put themselves. Um, and we have now started to ask within grade. Network studies in elementary school in the US are very, very easy to do because you can ask classroom. They're classroom-based networks. Middle school, when you have a middle school of 1,200 kids, you can imagine how many I know you guys deal with bigger, bigger nodes, but 1,200 is a lot to get to run some of our models. So we ask them to try to think about in their grade for some study. So what do we do here? We're going to do, just look at some simple ANOVAS exam of gender differences. We suspected gender differences, hypothesize those. Therefore, we would run the HLM separate. In this study, we used NICAPI. Um, it was NICAPI back then. Um, we no longer use NICAPI. And we then uh, did some multi-level modeling, both the individual and peer level influences on willingness to intervene. And we do, in fact, have some gender differences with males reporting a more positive, supportive attitude of bullying, thinking bullying is just kind of this thing with an effect size of 0.25. So, um, and the girls had higher levels of empathy and higher levels of perspective taking, so we ran our data. One, it's not really hard to do to run the data separate because we have boy groups and we have girl groups. In middle school, there's not a lot of cross-gender. In fact, there's a girl in a boy group, she's at risk in sixth and seventh grade for a lot of other things. Um, so in some ways, gender separation and the analyses are warranted at several levels. Um, girls are more willing to intervene both at pre and post. Remember, we're controlling for time one, predicting out time two. And boys are bullying more, although the effect sizes are a little bit lower than you might think. Um, girls are still bullies as well. And they do way more than mean girl things. They're actually, some of our girls are the most aggressive in our schools. And many teachers will not break up a girl fight. 
They will break up a boy fight, but not a girl fight. Okay. So here's the network this switch game for. Um, now that you've got the entire bullying problem under control of how I'm trying to, you know, advance social science and, and use their social network for this plight. For this NICA we had 2,500, about 2,500 pairwise reciprocated friendships. Um, my social network friends get all up and work, uh, but what about unreciprocated? I don't care. I want reciprocated friendships, nominations. I'm pretty sure I'm losing some information, but I'm okay with it. Um, and this is a problem that I've been trying to get support from NSF to get computer science and social network people to help us solve our missing data problem because we do have missing data problem, right? You might have kids in this data set that set, thought my task was a waste of their time. And they didn't give them any friends. Now, are they an isolate? I don't know. They just didn't want to complete the survey anymore, right? Or you might have kids writing down friends that aren't really their friends. So anyway, we're going to just not focus on the methodological problems there. And we're doing the best we can. Only 11% of the kids included names, 11% of the 2,500 uh, of students not enrolled in the study. Right. So if you nominated somebody that was not enrolled in the study, the data went out. I'm not allowed to analyze that data. I don't have the data on the child. 98% of the students identified at least one friend. The range was 0 to 8 because we gave them 8 spots. The mean number of friends is 5.90 with a standard deviation of 2. And this, you know, as we do these studies, when you're thinking about social network analysis and adolescent network, we're always comparing it to previous studies or what we know about the networks of an adolescent in 6th or 7th grade. And this is very consistent with what other scholars have found. 9% of the nominations were pairs of students not within the same grade, which is nice so that we can actually isolate our networks and be able to run our networks a little bit more smoothly. So the peer groups were modeled within grade. And there was no significant differences between 6th and 7th graders on the numbers of friends nominated. Okay. Now, this seems like excessive detail, but this is like five pages in a manuscript because they want to know all of this, right? So you have to track because you want to see if you're compromising some of your validity. So, so you have, get some sense of what we're talking about. For the sixth graders, we had 178 sixth graders. Uh, the NICAP yielded 14 peer groups, including dyads, um, ranging in size from two members to 41 members. And it didn't matter. This has been run through UCI Net. We have a group of 41 kids in the sixth grade. Part of the problem of trying to get this published, no one wants to believe that there's a group of 41 kids. But in this particular school, there is a group of 41 kids that hung out. Um, the mean was 6.57, which mapped on nicely. And what we've established is the 41 was the football team and the cheerleaders. Okay, they, They're it. They were real. Uh, we had 13% isolates, 22% liaisons. Liaisons, those that had have ties with a number of groups. This is an area where I would love somebody to say, I'd like to analyze your data. Because we suspect the liaisons have an interesting type of what we call social capital in middle school that those are the kids can navigate different peer groups, right? And so if and maybe they have the social capital that they could actually intervene and not lose their primary friendship group, or maybe people look up to them. We throw them out. So we've thrown them out for about, 15, about 10 years now. So we've got lots of liaisons that could be studied. There's a theory of a social butterfly that's emerging. Um, so if anyone wants to get on top of that, I'm sure the New York Times would love your, if you could get something to fit in a beautiful longitudinal SNA, you're good. Okay, seventh grade looked very similar, except we did not have the 20 mem we had we had a 20 member group, not a 41 member group, 11% isolates. The, quite, the problem is you can never do an isolate study because there's too much logical, many problems. What are you going to say about the isolates? Now, when I analyze the isolates, you would think, oh, are they more victimized? No, they're not, because they're probably not isolates. They probably didn't want to participate. They didn't participate. Well, I don't know what the problem is. So I'd like to figure out what the problem is, but we throw them out. Then we throw out the liaisons here, too. OK, so then um, the ultimate question of this study. If we control for someone's willingness to intervene in over a year period, I know who had, they hang out with, can we show some peer level influences on their willingness to intervene? And so we ran some multi-level modeling and unconditional models for the males separately. We found that 32% of the variance in willingness to intervene in wave two 
controlling for wave one, which oftentimes when you control for the individual propensity, it eats up all the variants. It didn't in this case. And that we still had 32% that was between groups, which indicated multi-level modeling was appropriate. Level one model, we found that wave one and wave two self-reported willingness to intervene was positive related. If I didn't intervene in the fall, I'm probably not going to intervene in the spring. If I intervene, it's just part of who I am. And I, or at least I'm telling you I'm going to intervene. That's what I'm going to tell you in the spring. For perspective taking, the ability to understand someone's cognitive position was significantly related to willingness to intervene after controlling for wave one. But the deviance indicated there were still variants to be explained. Most of the research stops here. This is a regression analysis, right? It stops here. And they report an R, and it's about 20%, and they say, teach them perspective taking. They rarely, if ever, go to level two where we say, okay, how much bullying was actually happening at the peer group level? We find here, controlling for wave one, if I hang out with kids that bully, I will be less likely to intervene over time, even controlling for my individual propensity. And in this case, we explained, once we took it from the individual to the peer, the total model explained 57% of the variance. That is huge in the world of social science, because what's not in this model is family, is the school level aggression, is the teacher's modeling. Now, my child development paper said 89% predicting bullying over time. That's pretty big. If 57, and this jumps from 12% to 57%, if willingness to intervene and standing up for another kid is explained by the peer level bullying, you better decrease the bullying before you tell the kids to intervene. It's that simple. Just telling the kids to intervene without changing the, the bullying at the peer level, not effective. Going back to the meta-analysis, why is it not working in the United States? For girls, you can see that the unconditional no model was 5% uh, variance, which did not even uh, institute uh, multi-level modeling, which means that willingness to intervene not necessarily predicted by peer groups for girls. We'll have to follow these data up, and we certainly are. But for males, it's a nice model. Certainly some limitations is collected from one middle school, self-report. That's why we would really like to go in and observe and see what these kids actually do. And the lack of homophily among the female groups and their willingness to intervene has to be replicated. OK. Let me take you to a second study here. And this is sexual harassment perpetration and dismissive attitudes towards sexual harassment among middle school peer networks. Um, I'm not going to give you too much of this background, but researchers who study sexual violence among college students um, find that rape on college campuses is largely controlled by a group think phenomenon. Um, rape prevention at the college campus has often been going into talking to freshman boys about how they should be nice to girls, and doing lectures in the fraternity, and shifting. If you can get the really popular guy in the frat to say to the buddy, I don't want to hear about what you did with her over the weekend, that's insultive. That's insulting. So the studies at the college level said there's a peer norm that contributes to the sexual violence that's happening on college campuses. What's happening more and more in our college campuses and in our high schools is what's called a social, and this is where social network is going to be very, very helpful. We're identifying the social influential leaders in high schools. So this is a big movement in Kentucky. They have the highest rates of sexual assault in this country, next to Alaska. And they're going in, and instead of telling everybody in the high school, don't date rape your girlfriends, they're going in and they're saying, who are the key leaders in this high school? Who really is the influential person? And they're pulling those, both girls and boys, out, and they're putting through them through the green dot training. They then plug them back in. And I'm sure you're, you, you're doing some of this in something else. They probably do it in the business world, but social science is 20 years on. And they do it in other areas of social psychology and organizational types of things. But in the bullying literature, no one's talked about this. In the aggression literature, we're so like, teach all the kids everything, primary, universal, and we're wasting a lot of money. 
because even in middle school, in middle school, if I wore an outfit, no one would care. But if Sally, I'm not even remember if Sally was popular, but if Sally wore an outfit, they'd be like, oh, God, did you see what Sally is wearing? And everybody wants to wear what Sally's wearing. Right? We do it as adults. We say, what is Beyonce wearing? Right? So this idea that we want to begin to build this theory, young, middle school and high school, where we go in and we figure out through social network analysis, who are the influential kids? And see if we can shift their attitude and have a contamination effect when you plug them back in that structure. Um, but there's no studies, you can imagine. There's not many studies asking 6th, 7th, and 8th graders if someone has touched them inappropriately. It's a hard study to do. It's hard, but we know that they do. In our schools, they're touching inappropriately all the time, which probably is shocking to you, but you guys are in graduate school and not in middle school. Okay. Um, so, research questions. Are adolescents, very, very, very similar questions to the other study. Our adolescents who engage in sexual harassment, perpetration, friends with one another. A low incidence phenomenon, you should know, but is there, let's start to build a theory around the social networks that involve sexual harassment. Does everybody know what sexual harassment is? It could be verbal, telling inappropriate jokes, posting inappropriate things, but in middle school, it's touching, groping at someone, um, they now, in many of our schools, play the nervous game. The nervous game is I get very close to you. It's kind of like that hot, cold game. And I get closer and closer to your genitals. And you say, are you nervous? You're nervous, 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 nervous. Now, what's the weird thing is, you become more popular the longer you can play the nervous game. So you can't just like get out real fast, like, yeah, I'm nervous. Get away from me, because that's not the norm. The norm is for both boys and girls to stay in the nervous game as long as possible. So sexual harassment, although lower incidence as far as touching the genitals, they get real close to that. Most of the sexual harassment that we're measuring in this study relates to spreading rumors of your sexual activity and calling you gay and spreading rumors of you doing things with the same thing. So a lot of it's verbal, rumor spreading, and then the kind of boundary issues. Do adolescents socialize one another to, to perpetrate sexual harassment? And do dismissiveness, meaning sexual harassment, that's not sexual harassment, that's just a game. Um, and bullying within peer groups predicts sexual harassment perpetration. Because see, if I play the nervous game both as a boy and a girl, and I don't see it as sexual harassment, is that dismissiveness associated with an increase over time? Okay. Um, 210 middle school students, this was from two Midwestern middle schools. We gave them the AUW, which is sexual comments to force sexual contact. Dismissiveness, the extent to which they just don't think it is, that sexual harassment is, the, is things like she deserves to get sexually harassed by the way she dresses, all those types of things. And then our uh, scale. As you know, how we ask the friendship nomination. In this particular study, we uh, use PSTAR analysis to examine the structure as it relates to sexual harassment perpetration. We also then embarked upon social network analysis via UCI net and then HLM. So there's our P star for the eighth grade results. Uh, boys and girls, kind of nice structure. In this particular data set, we had a better um, network structure, but you can still see quite, quite dense there. Now there's lots of results, but in this paper, and this was published. Yeah. Yes. Reciprocated ties. Friendship ties. No. And this? No. Gosh, that was like one of those schools. Um, yeah, no, no, no. And what you see is, I'm not sure what Hank did with these six ones, but they don't mean anything. So this is just the network. Yeah, just the network. Now I'm going to give you the two statistics that we interpreted which to me contradict one another, but listen to this. Okay, so this is what we're finding, is that we found a significant negative difference parameter suggesting that students who report sexual harassment perpetration at different levels, so 
So across the scale, do not, uh, do not often have ties to one another. Okay, that one makes good sense to me. Although I might have worked this out in my head on this slide. Then we found a positive sum parameter that showed that students who report sexual harassment perpetration more frequently do not seem to have ties to each other either, right? Okay, now, digging deeper into the P-star analysis and the cost of engaging in this behavior, what it comes down to, and the best we can interpret with P-star analysis, is that high-level perpetrators, while they choose to be friends with one another, with other sexual harassment perpetrators, they're not, are not any more likely to be friends with other high-level homophobic perpetrators. So what it appears, and this is where we need some better studies, is that there's friendship groups in which there's high perpetrators, but maybe only one or two. And once we break this down, you can actually start to see it a little bit more. So I usually have them a little bit more active there, interactive. So it's not as clear as bullying. And bullying, kids hang out together. They look pretty similar. Sexual harassment perpetration, however, it's not the case. That sometimes there's sexual, high-level sexual harassment perpetrators that are friends with the high-level sexual harassment perpetrators, but not always. Now, it makes sense, because how many sexual harassment perpetrators can you have in a group within the context of middle school, right? So, and again, this is one of the only studies published with this young, young group. Now, again, P-star analysis is not my specialty. It took me forever to understand exactly, because to me, it contradicted, like, what is, are they hanging out together or not hanging out together? Well, it depends. Right, but that showed that students who report more, yes, I know. I don't know. I can get you the paper, Nosh, and then we can talk it through. But Hank and I, hours and hours and hours and hours because it didn't make any sense to me. But this was the ultimate. That's the ultimate decision there, that high-level perpetrators, while they choose to be friends with other sexual harassment perpetrators, not any more likely to be friends with other high-level perpetrators. So they might be hanging out with kids that are lower on it, but they're not clustering together at the top. So it could be that there's just one. There might be a friend where the kid, one kid, who is in the group is a high-level sexual harassment perpetrator, but, but then there's varying levels of who they're having friends with. Which makes sense. Because how many people literally can be bantering in this way? OK, so the UCI net analysis, which I'm much more comfortable with. OK, we split this by grade. We included reciprocated friendships only. In school one, we had 18 peer groups ranging in size from 2 to 11. We had five mixed sex groups, which this is a more recent study. That's the largest number of mixed sex groups we've ever gotten in 10 years of this research. We had 15 mixed race, so because we're starting to look, I'm not presenting here, but we're starting to look at race and gender effects or mixed kind of sex effects. School two, it's 20 peer groups ranging in size from 2 to 11, 4 mixed sex and 16 mixed race. And here are the networks uh, for the 5th, the 6th, the 7th, and the 8th grade. As you can see, we have a couple dyads. Uh, unlike the other school, we don't have as dense of networks in this particular sample. In the conditional model for sexual violence perpetration, and here we kept the boys and girls in together because of the mixed um, groups, 22% of the variance in sexual harassment perpetration were between groups. Again, controlling for prior sexual harassment perpetration, we found that uh, wave one predicted wave two, but yet the peer level model would give us more explanation of the variance. Once we controlled for the peer level sexual harassment, it significantly predicted individual level perpetration and explained 37% of the variance. So you combine these studies in some way, bullying is seen as much more normative, right, acceptable. We back it down a little bit um, to something that's like willingness to intervene, which may not be as normal. Like maybe there are some kids that are intervening, so the peer effect falls apart a little bit then here's something that's not so normal that we see that the peers have only an explanation of 
which then suggests to me if you're trying to slow down bullying and you're explaining upwards of 89 to 90 percent of the variants, the peer group phenomenon should be, you know, targeted. Interesting in and of itself across the different types, and which which is encouraging to know that kids perhaps do draw the line in what they're willing to support as a peer group to keep it continuing, right? For bullying in our child development, it was 90% of the variance. Physical fighting was 70%. Kids backed off and said, I'm not going to participate with that. It appears for willingness to intervene. We have some kids that are willing to intervene, and the peer, doesn't, peer group doesn't hold as much weight. Encouraging here that only 37% of the variance, but 37% of the variance is still a high variance in social science child development literature. Now, what I wanted to understand is we're starting to build from these simple homophily types of models into complex models. And we're adding even more complexity in our current studies with an intervention effect as well. Um, in level one, we found the individual level of bullying perpetration significantly predicted sexual harassment perpetration, but dismissiveness did not. Kids that were bullying were more likely to be sexual harassment perpetrators over time. We did find a slope as outcomes important here, though, in that the relationship between bullying perpetration and sexual harassment perpetration varied across the peer groups. Thank goodness, because this means that in some peer groups, bullying escalates to sexual harassment perpetration, but not in all groups. And unpacking that is important as well. At the level two, Peer level bullying perpetration was significant predictor of sexual harassment perpetration. At wave two, when controlling wave one, uh, sexual harassment and bullying, 76% of the variance was explained. Dismissiveness was not significant. So peer level bullying was associated with sexual harassment perpetration. Meaning there's a link, but it's not a one-to-one -one link. And it varies depending perhaps on the structure of the peer group, the gender makeup of the peer group, what we're actually measuring. If it's a mixed sex peer group, there might be some of that sexual harassment perpetration that we're picking up on that's within that group. And that's my, my, why we're finding the slopes as outcomes as significant. Um, and this is a nice trick in UCI net, again, not being so sophisticated, but those are the same kids, wave one bullying, where red is high, the black is moderate, and the blue is low. And so what we're trying to start doing now, which Sienna is going to help us tremendously over the longitudinal nature of this, but if you look at even this small, I think this is, yeah, right here. You know, this is a group of high bullies. And look at them. They're all hanging together. They're high, all red. And by wave two, they're engaging in moderate level of sexual violence and one character here with low. Now, the problem with the sexual violence construct at the grade 6, 7th, and 8th, we're not sure exactly what we're measuring, right? And if, I mean, that's a problem in some ways, because what would be the normal trajectory between 6th grade and 7th grade or 5th grade and 6th grade? We don't know because no one studied the phenomenon. We have nothing to refer to. Is a, you know, high bully going to a moderate SV of concern? We need a much better kind of even descriptive nature over time of what these groups look like. Lots of bullying going on in this group and some sexual violence going on. What do you do about a high bully and a high sexual violence? Now, what if what we're measuring in sexual violence, meaning you're gay, you're a fag, you're having this sexual, you know, if most of it's homophobic in nature, is it that the bullying is just becoming homophobic in time, over time? What I'm not presenting to you today is we have a causal model over three years where we show causally, causally, bullying, causally linked to homophobic bullying, causally linked to sexual harassment, a mediating model. So if, in fact, it's a phenomenon at the society level that bullying includes homophobic banter, which it seems to be in our models, then we have to understand that these two may be one and the same in this young population. But again, to unpack these types of social influences on top of that's going to require some really good longitudinal Sienna. And we have a network, so anybody want a second dissertation idea? You got it. Yeah. Um, 
So what do we find here? Homophily exists among peer groups for sexual violence perpetration. Birds of a feather flock together, except the P-star says, well, it's not that kind of simple. Bullying perpetration was related to sexual perpetration, but it varied depending on peer group, varied across the peer groups, hence the slopes as outcome. Peer-level bullying is a significant predictor, but we need to unpack these peer influences and build more complex models. For me, ultimately, I would like to think that someone's going to read my top tier journal articles and understand how social network analysis is important, and the federal panels are. But if we're going to get practice to just change on the ground, because ultimately, I, as much as I like statistics, and I like peer groups, and I like multi-level modeling, I also want to help kids. I also would like to turn on the TV for one week and not hear about a suicide. That would make me very happy. So what I would like the United States to do is to start investigating the best ways in which we can shift the peer norm that's maintaining bullying and sexual harassment in our schools. And if we look at um, the potential overlap in another, other studies, bullying is becoming homophobic. It's causally linked. We actually show in our schools a socialization process. Let me break this down to you very simply. In the US schools, we have bullying. You're fat, you're this, your mom is this, blah, blah, blah. We call garden variety bullying. By seventh grade, it's you're gay, you're this, it's all homophobic. We then show that that relationship, bullying to homophobic bullying, then leads to sexual harassment. Because the best way to demonstrate that you are heterosexual in middle school, or at least to demonstrate you're not gay, is to publicly sexually harass a girl. And if in fact that's true, and we found that causal link, and we also found that the connection between bullying and sexual harassment is moderated by traditional masculinity. And if anybody's following the Penn State thing, what it's done is it's brought traditional masculinity right there in New York. We're actually talking about the fact that boys are policed to be heterosexist, and this is, and there's a major cover-up, we find any longitudinal model bullying related to sexual harassment when you hold this idea that boys need to be a certain way. And guess what? Girls hold that tradition of masculinity. That model holds for both boys and girls. So that's all great social science research. Nobody's reading it, right? So when I write briefs for Congress, Senate, in an op-ed, and my chair says, where's your other 15 top-tier journal articles? They've lost sight of where we're at because the bottom line, if until we have prevention programs that map onto what's happening in our schools, bullying will not go away. Most of the bullying prevention programs that are promoted in our schools were developed in the 80s and 90s. Okay. Some of them are run through a VCR. Have you heard of those? VHS, VCR. Yeah. So we're outdated, social science is not being paid attention to. However, what we do know in this country is that the federal panels of NIH, NIDA, NIDA, they like social network research. So this is a place where we can not help them address a serious problem that the Senate and Congress and all the parents in the country want to address, but you could do it some really cool social network, social network analysis that has potency in explaining this phenomenon. These are not fudged data. I didn't go in and change the numbers. This is real. So much so that in our lab, we run things 10 times because we're in disbelief of the variance explained. Right? And we're awake at night thinking, I hope that it was just not a problem with the software. Um, but we're consistently finding this across the phenomenon. Pure influence needs to be considered in developing and evaluating prevention programs. 67 to 70 bullying prevention program, one attempts to target and shift the peer norms. And that second step, which we're evaluating right now, we are collecting networks with some 3,800 kids across three years in intervention and control schools. And um, I'm trying to get a grant to get a postdoc just to be committed to analyzing those data to see if we can figure out in those schools where the program worked, where the implementation was high and there was a shift in efficacy. Did the networks look different in three years in comparison to even intervention schools where there was not an effect. Because I'll tell you again, an intervention school in the south side that's probably not, it's an intervention school probably not going to see an effect. And it has nothing to do 
with the program, it has more to do with the chaos in that school and the neighborhood. In other schools, it's looking like it's shifting the peer norms. But how do we show that change? We go, we're going to show it through uh, longitudinal CR and a good postdoc. And if you have your own money, come along. Champagne's an exciting place. <laughs> or not. Um, so that's kind of, I covered a lot of area. You probably know more about bullying than you want to know. So you'll not, you, know, you won't go up to a bully researcher and go, why can't you fix it? You'll now know, wow, this is probably why we're not fixing it, right? Um, but there's a need to fix it. When you're going to start firing teachers and ex suspending kids, it's a big issue. It's a real big issue in our state because we have 35% African-American kids that are suspended. There's 70% of them. They're represented in 70% of the suspensions. So if we continue with this throwing kids out because teachers see bullying, it's going to be a problem. But hang out with me. I will tell you just how problematic the United States of America is. <coughs> Not just the bullying, right? <laughs> Question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. What kinds of questions? Building quality questions, analysis, analysis questions. Volunteer to analyze data questions. Questions about, 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 about the data questions. Yes. Yeah. Sure. I'll send you the paper. No. Yeah, and you know how to do that, right? So she asked about puberty. And we have done this in our obesity and eating disorder study when we had an IRB that let us ask these questions. Because typically we'll ask about hair in certain places or we'll show them little pictures. So we had that in our first network obesity eating disorder study. But then that was one thing we had to let go in that particular study. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, I think anecdotally, you could think about that being the case. Um, for girls, early maturing girls are rejected, right? The early maturing, other girls don't like to see other girls maturing early. Because they get the boys' attention, you know, in the heterosexual family. For the boys, I'm not so sure. Yeah. Um, we, when we do surveys, we have 42 minutes that a middle school kid could sustain attention with us. 42 minutes. And that has to include getting in, explaining all the IRB stuff, you know, that we're not going to torture them and then they can stop at any time, blah, 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 to the ending where we always end with networks. So we always want to make sure that we get our networks, right? even so that we'll cut out in the middle if kids aren't getting along. Um, so we have to make very, very difficult decisions about constructs. Um, but that would be a nice study to do. If you, what was that? What? Sure. Yes, we can get height. We now have IRB approval, especially in this office, to get everything. Test scores, truancy, every every single thing. It took a year to get it, but we have caught wrong. We can get everything. So we could get height and weight. Yeah. And I think that would be important because we also just got um, in our longitudinal studies and the kids that are in the RCT, we just got arrest data and social services data. So when you hear that bullies are more likely to be criminals, that's in Norway, it's not in the United States. And now we just, so we're always kind of looking to add those kind of supplemental data. Um, in our study of the kids we're tracking now that are in high school, 12% have already been arrested. It's great. <laughs> so we actually say, what is that? Or if they've been in foster care or other types of things, yeah. But puberty, I've never thought about that. Great. Other questions? Quietest group ever. Yes? What about the record of the suspension? Uh, it's, you're, you're 
Yeah, so we will. We will. Um, we have a large, elaborate attrition model, right? So, and, and I'll use the randomized clinical trials as an example. So, we've already surveyed pre baseline, implemented 15 weeks, and then did a post survey. And I have to find every one of those kids. So, I know in that 3,800 who's moved to a, from an intervention to a control, I know who's moved to an alternative school. I know who's been suspended. So we'll map all of that on. We have every bit of data that we can find. Now, 15, we had 15% attrition in that pre to post in one year. And I've tracked down most of those kids. Um, but Central Illinois to have a family member, but I'm hoping they come back and can impute their data. Kids that have gone from a regular intervention school to an alternative school will eventually come back to that school in the district. So yeah, we have lots of input into the data. And that's built into our HLM multi-level modeling as covariates. Yeah. We just had a two-hour meeting today to figure out impute backwards, impute forwards, impute at the individual level, impute at the scale level. What do we do about the kids that are in there? So. That's why you hang out with statisticians that love having a conversation. And then they said, OK, well, we probably shouldn't impute the kids that weren't in pre or post. I was like, oh, yeah, that would be pretty good, because they wouldn't be in the study. So that was the ending of the phone call. I was like, on that note, I'm good. We're going to impute forward and backward. But yeah, so. Sure. The one that we're continuing the kids? OK. Well. Yeah, OK, so Centers for Disease Control funded uh, the first three, five data collection points over a two and a half year period. What we're very much interested in is the extent to which um, kids that bully, how, when they enter certain peer groups and when they might exit out of certain peer groups, right? Now, and that's not in the RCT, because the RCT, we would expect, hopefully, that some big bad bullies, as the norm shifts, they would be kicked out. So that's a different kind of study. But in this study, what we want to also know is parallel processing, right? So as a kid uh, joins a group that bullies, how does that child's attitude change over time? Um, at the same time, we want to know what happens to kids that are being victimized. Do they exit that group? Do they then go over to a group that uses drugs and alcohol, right? So do they shift over to a risky peer group? So in that study, um, we're able to ask a number of different questions uh, because we have about 32 psychological constructs, right? So we have exposure to domestic violence in the home, physical abuse, sexual abuse, anger, impulsivity, peer norm, delinquency, alcohol and drug use, and you can have about 20 others. Um, what I'm very much interested in is what types of trajectories and pathways, certainly we're doing growth curve analysis, do we see risk profiles, protective profiles, but then what do those, kid, what do those kids look like within the context of the network, both protective, because networks can be protective as well as risky. And there's a few recent papers that have come out and shown that kids that are chronically victimized in middle school are more likely to use alcohol and drugs, but we know that alcohol and drugs is really peer driven in high school. So there's lots of questions. Now the NIJ is now funding us to look at how 6th, 7th, and 8th graders who bully or engage in sexual harassment then become involved in dating violence over time. So um, those would be some of the questions that would be of interest to me theoretically. 